Now, what's interesting to kind of sum up this whole situation, while it was a very bad situation in the first place, I think good's going to come out of this because this is a topic that's not been addressed very well in the Muslim community, and it needs to be. And given that I'm already an activist in other causes, I think, you know, now that it's me, you know, now that it's my issue, now that it's out there, I need to stand up for it. It's just odd that for two years I'm praying in the women's section with no issue. And suddenly there's like a firestorm. And, you know, I do want to come back to the community. I mean, I can go to any mosque. That particular mosque is the one that's closest to me. They also do certain things other mosques don't. They're kind of the central mosque in the valley. For instance, all of the, to my knowledge, all of the funerals, we call them janazas, all of the janazas are held at that mosque. So if somebody dies, that's the mosque that's going to have the funeral prayer. So even, even if I don't, you know, I, even if I hated the mosque, which I don't, you know, and I, I don't have a problem with the mosque. I love the mosque and I love the community there very, very much. It's the leaders, you know, that obviously I'm having some issues with. But there is actually, a, a, Islamically, there is a religious need for me to be able to be a part of that community because, again, there's certain functions that are specific to that mosque that the other mosques don't do. It's, it's kind of the main mosque of Phoenix. Right. It's the big mosque. You know, it's interesting, you know, politics and religion. <laughs> Much of my life has actually been a journey on both seeking truth and finding justice. And I've actually found they've intertwined. Because when it comes to seeking justice, that is really where I've explored different political philosophies. That's really where I've, I've gotten into social justice movements and things like that. When it comes to finding truth, you know, it's been parallel to this where I've explored different religions, where I've, I mean, for, for a good decade or more, I've been, I've studied different religions. I've, I've explored, you know, I've looked into, you know, Judaism, Hinduism, you know, I grew up, um, you know, Christian Protestant, but I, I've looked into, I mean, most major world religions I've, I've read quite a bit about. I'm not an expert. But, I mean, I, I, I kind of, you know, I, I have a, you know, I do have knowledge in a lot you, of You them. have a personal interest, and you had a personal interest in exploring. Ex exactly, exploring the truth, you know. And um, so, you know, that basically, you know, eventually brought me to Islam. Um, and I converted in March of 2013, and, and it's funny that I had already looked at a lot of other faiths, and so by that time I was really coming across, you know, by the time I was really looking into Islam more closely, I actually was more skeptical towards Islam than the other religions because it's like, well, geez, you know, of all religions, how could I ever be a Muslim, you know? <laughs> and, you know, I, but I found this Quran, you know, in my apartment that I had lost for years and I started reading it. And it just, the flow of it, like everything about it was different than any book I had ever read. Um, just the, not, it, it, the content of it, what it said, but also like the flow of it. And I couldn't ignore it. It, it really appealed to you. It totally appealed to me. You, did, you couldn't put it down? Exactly. Okay. And it, it just, again, it was different from other religious texts that I had read. What, what uh, can you describe, what, what made it different for you personally as an individual? Um, how, how is it different? You know, it's interesting that, I don't want to trivialize it, but in a sense, um, it has the, it, it's some. I hate, I don't know, I don't want to say it's like an, instru it had more of a format of being an instruction manual, but not in a way that would be, you know, I said this, I hate to use this analogy, but. It's very much like, it is very much an instruction manual on how to live your life. So instead of an instruction manual on a computer or a car, this is like how to live your life. And it, it has very much of this flow to it that if you want to be on the path towards, you know, righteousness, 
do this. If you want to be on the path towards, you know, destruction, do that. And, um, and it was, you know, very much, there is kind of that plus minus, you know, this is what, you know, if you do this, you will get that. If you do this, you will get that and so forth. And, but it's written, I mean, it's, it's, it, again, it's not like any other book I've, I've read. Like I've, I actually compared it to the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, you know, and some other books were like, there's a lot of similar concepts actually. But I found like in, in like the Torah, for instance, like there was one concept, I don't remember what it was, but it, there were about six paragraphs that talked about a particular concept. And in the Quran, it addressed that same concept in literally one verse or one ayah, as we call it. So and, put in another way. Yeah, there's something about it where it says the most in the fewest amount of words. So it refined the same concept or idea. Exactly. I mean, it's, it, it really says a lot of stuff in the fewest possible words. That's my take on it. Okay. And, and since your conversion, um, what kind of impact has it made on your life? Uh, living your life according to this, this manual or way to live, what, what do you gain from it? I feel like it's really helped to me to find direction in life. Um, it's really helped me... I feel it's put me on a healthier path in life. I mean, I, not that I was necessarily on a destructive path, but, you know, it's, it's, I feel so much happier since I converted. I feel so much more at inner peace. And I just feel like my life has more meaning. And, and if anything, I feel like my life is more organized. You know, versus just helter-skelter, you know, I have this going on, this going on, that going on, this going on. I still have all these different things going on, but I feel like my life has more of a purpose now. Like, I understand. It's more regimented? It is more regimented. But I feel like there's more direction there, like there's more of a focus. But I actually, you know, it's funny, people that don't understand, you know, but a lot of people have a misconception that Muslims are very judgmental. And it is true that there are Muslims that are. But I actually feel like I'm, I've, I, I, I just feel like all the way around I, tr I treat people a lot better now than I used to. I'm more careful. You know, I, I'm less likely to use, you know, foul language. You know, I'm less likely to do, you know, I'm less likely to have bad habits and more likely to be careful on how I interact with others. More courteous, more respectful, more likely to give people the benefit of the doubt. Again, though, I'm not perfect. I do have my bad habits, but there has been an improvement, and, I feel. And, and, and so essentially what you're saying is since you've converted over to Muslim, you've become more open-minded to other people in general? In terms of like, well, you know, I still have my beliefs. I mean, I well, I have, this is interesting. I have, it's a tough one because, you know, my beliefs are more strict. So my belief system is more strict. So in that sense, I'm not going to be as open-minded in terms of my personal beliefs, like like my concept of God or my concept of certain certain religious matters are more are more strict. But in terms of how I how I treat other people, how I approach other people, that is done with far more open-mindedness and and reserved judgment. I'm not going to say like, oh, well, you're in this box or you're in that box, so I'm just going to have nothing to do with you. I'm just going to, you know, none of that. I'm, I, it's, it's made me more open-minded towards other people and their ideas, you know, being able to be willing to listen, willing to hear other points of view, if, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. It's kind of, a, it's an interesting kind of balance because it's like... <sighs> I guess you could say people that kind of have one extreme or the other, you could have somebody that's like, they stand for everything, which means they stand for nothing. Or you could have people, you know, too open-minded that they accept everything, including things that really aren't healthy. Or you could have the other extreme where people are so narrow-minded that they don't accept anybody. They you know? omit everything. Yeah, all everything. All information, all individuals that they don't understand. Exactly. And that's kind of the other extreme. And I feel like with me, it's very much the right, the path of moderation where it's like, you know, I do have my views on things. I do have my opinions on things. 
I do have those aspects of me and my personality that are very fixed, very unlikely to be changed. On an individual level. On an individual level. But when it comes to, you know, respecting other people, it's that's very much there as well. So this is a, you know, this is a very big topic and it's a very important one. And, you know, now that there's a lot of stories going around, I mean, I, it's not a subject I very much talked about before, but I think now is a perfect time to address it. Um, you know, the topic of gender and in and of itself is a big one. Um, and, you know, it actually is one of those things that most human beings see and this is not just has to do with Islam. I mean, this is just humanity in general, that most people see gender as very black and white. You know, a baby is born, and immediately the doctor makes that call, boy or girl. The birth certificate's immediately stamped with either, you know, an M or an F. Done deal. But actually, you know what, just like anything else in our world, not everything is as concrete. Not everything, you know, there is a level of abstract. There is a level of a gray area. And there are a small percentage of people that are actually born with, you know, as I call it, rare gender conditions. And sometimes it is a physical issue where, you know, there's a physical anatomical issue where it's, you know, there's a mixture of male and female attributes. Um, physically. Some, physically. Right. Sometimes it's not physically at all. Sometimes it's, you know, everything looks normal at birth. And there are physical issues that come up later, like when the, when the child develops. Um, going through adolescence, sometimes there can be some issues that show up and they find some things that are, you know, some, they call, basically there's some intersex, what it's called, um, issues that happen, and, and I'm not actually an expert on all this stuff, um, but there can be, you know, these, it's not as black and white, and, um, you know, I don't want to get into too technical stuff. Then you have, when you come, get into the topic of transgender, um, basically what happens is you have people where pretty much all of their physiology is of one sex or one gender, but their brain psychology is very much of the opposite sex. Sometimes there's physical development issues too, so it can sometimes be an element of both. Um, but transgender generally means it's kind of a mismatch between the body and the mind. Sometimes, you know, I think the common phrase that people use now, which they'll say gender identity or gender expression, you know, I don't necessarily... I don't necessarily use those terms to describe it because I don't, you know, identity, it, it, that's kind of, it's kind of a vague approach because an identity could be a choice or it could not be a choice. Here's what's been happening when it comes to me. So, you know, I was actually assigned male at birth. And um, so I did grow up, you know, as a boy, you know, I did grow up that way. But there were both, there were actually both, um, phys there were actually physical development types of issues. It's medical and I don't want to get into it. And my psychology was always very much that of a female. Um, even when I was a small child, like, like there were so many signs from age, you know, three you know, throughout childhood, throughout adolescence, like there were, con there was consistent evidence of this. And, you know, anyway, eventually this, this actually took until adulthood to where I finally came to terms with it all. I mean, it's a lot to deal with. Most people don't have to deal with something like Most this. Most people would and have a, trouble understanding. And, and a lot of people would have trouble understanding it because it's, it's rare for one. And again, it's like if you're not going through that, like it's it's extremely difficult to even con to, to even perceive. If there's any way I try to help people understand that this, it's the, it, it, it's to use this example. You know, the overwhelming majority of people are very sure of their gender. But let's say you went to sleep and one day, you know, you woke up and suddenly you were in the body of the other gender, but your brain is still the same. You're the same you. You're the same old self. 
I mean, most people would panic. I mean, it, you know, it'd be a, it'd be an emergency. You know, they've they've got to get their body fixed immediately. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's something. You know, they, they and that's yeah. kind of what. But in this case, that's kind of what has happened. Is at you know, the brain psychology is of one sex and the body is of the other. Anyway, so with me, I finally came to terms with that, and it wasn't like it was just whims and desires. And a lot of people that don't understand this, they think that it's like. And I, I'm again, we were talking about like media and stuff. You know, they sensationalize. A lot of people think it's whims and desires where, you know, it's like this trend or a fad or something where somebody. Or you're just being perverse. Exactly. And somebody just decides, hey, I'm going to go change sex. And they just, you know, get up one morning and they, you know, find a doctor. And it's just, That's I mean, it doesn't work it that is. way. <laughs> you know, you, you remind me of I an mean, analogy. <laughs> It doesn't work that way. I mean, if, if somebody actually did approach it that way, they probably, you know, they probably do have a mental illness, you know, but it, I don't want to make judgments either. Right. But the way the media portrays it is, is very inaccurate most of the time. What happened with me was I did come to terms with this, which was a lot to have to come to terms with. Uh, it took but a I number had to, of years. It took yeah, most I had of your to, life. I had to face it because it wasn't, I realized it's like, you know, I couldn't ignore all the signs. And, and some of the signs were actually physical, too. It wasn't just psychological. There were physical issues. And I, again, that's kind of personal. I'm not going right. to get into it. No problem. But anyway, long story short, I did sit down with, I mean, it ended up being a whole team. And, and this is typically how these things are done, where it's a team of professionals. Usually you'll have two mental health professionals um, like a therapist and a counselor, as well as a psychiatrist, because they want to make sure, you know, we're, we are talking about the brain here. And then you also have the medical side where you have your primary care doctor, you have, you know, an endocrinologist possibly, for, you know, to look at, because you have to look at what's going on hormonally with the person. Sometimes the hormones aren't right in the first place. Um, or again, that's part of the transition. And then you have, you know, you can have surgeons involved. So it's a whole team. And so I came to terms with all of this and, you know, I went through the, the transition um, and, you know, the doctors do consider me a female. You know, I, I'm consider you know, that this was reassigned to use the words that they use. You know, I am considered a female, you know, legally, socially, medically, and so forth. But again, this is an area a lot of people have trouble with because people think that, people think that once sex is black and white, and, and it's, in most people's cases, it's pretty fixed, but you know, people think that it's only chromosomes, or that it's only genitals, or that it, but actually there's all these different, uh, there's science that disproves those theories, um, that it's, you can't, if you say that this is 100% of the populace, there's scientific examples that, that prove that that's not 100%. So again, I'm getting technical, but it, it is a combination. There's always an exception to the rule. There's an exception to the rule. I mean, it, it's, it's a combination of factors. I mean, you have chromosomes, genitals, you have secondary characteristics. Estrogen. You have hormones, you have psychology, you have reproductive abilities. I mean, it's a combination of these things. And when there's mismatches, that's when you have a lot of times transgender issues or what's called intersex issues. And sometimes people have both. So... I went through the transition. It was a matter of medical privacy to me. You know, my documents, you know, say female. You know, I have a female name. I live my life as a female. I am a female. You know, the only people that need to know about my past are close friends, a prospective husband. Obviously, you know, getting married, I think, you know, a prospective husband has a right to know you know, I mean, how, how can you get honest. married with somebody if you don't know anything? Of, you know, you, you, need right. to, you need to know the intimate details about each other. So, you know, my idea was this was kind of on a need-to-know basis. That was my approach. And that's how it was. A big interest of mine is social justice, and um, it's something I've done off and on for a long time. I mean, I would say really around 2003 when I was um, at the U of A was when I really started getting into politics and social movement and things of that nature. And, and it's hard to say how it started. I think it just kind of, it was one of those interests that developed.
Um, so just to kind of give you a little bit of history, um, you know, I've been interested on, on these types of things for a long time, um, you know, going to marches and rallies and protests, but not just that type of activism. You know, going to lectures, you know, um, having dialogues, having, you know, attending discussion groups, um, you know, being on committees, you know, seeing like what you what can we do to make the world a better place? What can we do to speak out against injustice? What can we do to fix these things? So in, in other words, you 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 spent your personal time and effort seeking out information. Absolutely. And, details. and that's another thing is I'm very, it's very important for me to try to get the facts. I don't just believe what a news article says. I don't just believe what somebody says. And I think that's very important because no matter what the facts are, it's human nature that everybody wants their own angle to it. They want to their own slant. And you have to be, a, I, I feel like you have to really kind of be a researcher. You have to really find out what's going on. You can't just take a piece here or there. You have to really, you have to understand the problem first before you can really start looking for solutions. And that's the problem in society today is usually it's, it's just jumping to conclusions. People have knee-jerk emotional reactions versus careful, logical thought. Analogy. And, and exactly. Well, I have no, you know, most people in the Muslim community really support me on this, on the gender issue mm -hmm. now that it's come out and they support me on other the things. The larger majority. Exactly. Okay. But I have gotten a few people that, you know, are concerned about my protesting and stuff and they, and, and they basically say like this leader that, you know, you need to obey the laws of the land. As I've been very public lately as an activist, you know, private things have a way of coming to the surface. And when you change a name or a government document, that is a public record. So if somebody wants to try to dig on somebody, they can find this stuff out. I don't know all that happened behind the scenes, but I've been going to the Tempe Mosque for two and a half years. And... I do know that it was this past Ramadan, which was in July, I actually saw a detective there from Phoenix police who I had seen at the Phoenix protests. And I thought that was odd seeing him at the Tempe mosque. You know, different Just on an off day? or Yeah, a different jurisdiction for one. I mean, the mosque isn't even in Phoenix. And then I had seen him at the protests. Well, I know that he specializes in this type of stuff. He's with a certain department within Phoenix police. Well, it turns out there had been a meeting at the mosque and my name had come up and I found this out from one of the mosque leaders. You know, I've heard that apparently there's been rumors at the mosque before this, like apparently, I mean, this is what I've heard that, you know, there had been some people questioning my gender, but it never became an issue for me because nobody came to me about it. No one came to me and said, Samaya. You know, are you a woman or are you a man? You know, nobody can. As they should have before they started talking, yeah. I'm sure. But what's very odd, and the timing is very suspicious, is if somebody truly had an issue with my gender or questioning my gender, you would think that would surface the moment I became Muslim, the moment I started going to the mosque. But it didn't happen until two years later when I was a big-time activist. These det this detective shows up, the next day, a friend comes to me and says, there's all these rumors going on about you. And apparently, suddenly, there's like a dozen women all saying, that's a man, that's a man, that's a man. But I didn't know who was spreading the rumors. This is my friend now telling me she's hearing all these rumors. It's like, suddenly, all this starts. I don't know how it started, but suddenly, again, the timing is very odd. I get called into a meeting the next day with the chairman of the board. And these questions came up, and, you know, I didn't want to give him the information. It's a private matter. So I had actually given the mosque about a year prior my driver's license and my U.S. passport because they were printing up a document for me, you know, down the road. If I travel to Muslim countries and for certain religious functions, they're going to want a piece of paper that says I converted. Um, and so, you know, they wanted to, I wanted that document just to have it on hand, um, so they needed the passport number and so forth. So I knew that the mosque had already seen my identification. 
So I mentioned when this when this question came up about my gender, I mentioned, well, actually, you know, I am a woman. I don't know why people are spreading rumors because until they talk to me, you're asking me to explain why somebody else would be accusing me. I'm like, I don't know who's accusing me. Like, I don't have all the information, you know. But I told him, I said, you know, I'm, I am a woman and the office has actually seen a couple of official government IDs that say I'm female. Normally, in most cases, that, that would end it there. I mean, like, I could go apply for a job tomorrow, and they're going to ask for a social security card and a driver's license, and that's it. They're not, I mean, even if they do a background check for a job, they're going to look for, like, criminal stuff or what. They're not going to try to dig like that. I don't, you know, usually they don't. No, I, I, I don't think, uh, I think that would be considered discrimination. Exactly. Nowadays. And it is. Well, we kept going around in circles um, where he didn't find that this was evidence because he was arguing that these documents didn't really prove one's sex that anybody can kind of just go to the government and change their gender. And, you know, that's actually not true. I had brought up seeing this detective a couple of days before, and that's when he had mentioned that there had been this, this meeting and my name had come up. And then he revealed that he had already done a private background check. Like it kind of, I don't want to say it wasn't like a private investigator or something to that level, but he pay, he did say, he did say paying $35. I don't know if it was his money or the mosque's money, but he actually went online and, and paid money to do the whole background investigation. Where, Before even talking to you. Exactly. And so here I had spent probably an hour mm -hmm. talking to him he already had the information. So, I mean, I totally felt... So he knew the history. I totally felt caught off guard for one and deceived. And I wasn't lying to him because when I said, I am a woman, I am a female, that's not lying. That's true. It's but it, true by law, by, by exactly. physical, by every aspect it could yeah, be. But I didn't feel it was his business to be told this prior information. Well, he already had the birth certificate. And he's like, well, I haven't looked at the birth certificate, but I can click on it. So he wanted me to, well, but guess what? Here's the thing, because see, now I'm caught in a trap in the sense that, you know, he has the record showing what I was originally assigned. And that's what a birth certificate's <clears throat> going to show is that when I was, when I was born, I was assigned a male. And he admitted, you know, he had seen, and I actually have no criminal, I don't have any criminal conviction, so I have no criminal record. But guess what? I have been arrested before. And, you know, those records become public, even though they throw out the charges. There's still an arrest record. And he's like, well, I see you had a booking as a male. And then more recently, it was as a female. So at that point, what am I supposed to do? I'm not going to lie. And I, I don't think you were lying to begin with. And I yours. wasn't lying to begin right. with. Um, so I just explained, you know, much of the same thing I explained, you know, I was explaining now on, on to, you know, to you that, you know, I then explained to him that, you know, this is what was going on at, at you know, I, you know I, that I was assigned male at birth and that I transitioned and so forth. So then at that point, you know, I thought it's like he seemed, I thought he was accepting of the situation, but he still wanted more proof that I'm a female now. So even though, and so we, we continued going around in circles because, you know, and I explained to him, I said, if you saw a recent booking that said <clears throat> female and you've seen recent documents that say female, isn't that proof enough? Well, it wasn't. He wanted a medical document. So I agreed to it, and I gave him this, it's, it wasn't like, it's not like a whole medical file, it's one piece of paper, and I told him, you know, this is like a HIPAA-compliant form where, you know, the doctor's not going to list the medical procedures. They're not, it's, this is not medical records. It's one piece of paper that says, my name went through a gender transition, the new gender is, is female. It doesn't list medical treatments, it's just the doctor's statement of of fact of what 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 was and what now is okay so i brought it in and i explained to him he looked at it he said i think this is going to be fine and he wanted to take a picture for his own you know electronic records and it's like well he's the chairman of the board and i said okay but i don't want you to show it to anybody without getting my permission first and he gave me his word he said well here's how i'm going to address it and i'm pretty sure this is verbatim how he said it 
he was saying like you know if if anybody asks or if you know if anyway if any to close the issue he was going to say quote i've done my due diligence and samaya is a woman end quote he was telling me you know he wasn't going to say any more he wasn't going to get into medical he wasn't going to get into history he wasn't going to say anything other than he's done his as a leader He's done his due diligence, and Samaya is a woman. So, so that was his word. For me to understand it, first off, obviously this is a very personal and, and, and an issue that you wanted to keep private. Exactly. It, it has nothing to do with it's nobody else's business but Correct. yours. Have they addressed you with your questioning of authority at all? You know, it's funny in the July meeting when the when the whole gender issue came up. And he had said that he did this background check, and he said he talked to this detective. He also had my Facebook page up. And he said um, he was aware of my activism. And it's interesting. He actually did compliment me on some things. Like, he actually liked some of the pictures I had on Facebook. He actually liked some of my politics and, and things that I was doing. At the same time, he also referenced, like, he also referenced, like, an incident where, you know, with, it was an anti-police brutality march where there was some anarchists, um, and, and so forth. I didn't really comment to him about it, um, but I, I got the impression that, you know, he didn't really approve of, of everything that I do. Oh, did, did he not approve of your associations? Well, he kind of phrased it like this, like, make sure that you're obeying the law. Islamic law or the... The law of the land. Okay. Which brings me to another point. You know, he did tell me when I go out and protest, he did say, when you go out and, you know, when you go out and protest, when you do your activism and your social justice, you need to make sure to follow the laws of the land. He did say that. Well, the irony is the laws of the land also say I'm a female. So it's kind of like he's telling me to follow the laws of the land but yet he doesn't want to follow what the laws of the land say about my sex do or my gender. Think, do you think, aside from... <laughs> I mean, you know, so there, again, it's... Yeah. it's see, do as I say, not as I do, unfortunately. <laughs> the irony of people is probably the only thing that's infinite. <laughs> <laughs> I, to me, there's a major trust issue when a religious leader, or a leader of any institution, but particularly a religious leader, I mean... You know, talking to detectives and doing background checks on their congregants when there's no reason to. Prior to talking to yeah, the congregants. Yeah, and, and I don't know what the detective, I don't know what that was about. But, you know, my activism is legal and constitutional. So, there, I mean, you know, I'm not breaking any laws. Now, again, just because I've gotten arrested doesn't mean I've gotten convicted. You know, anybody can get charged with anything, but you're innocent until proven guilty. But unfortunately, that's not how it well. <laughs> sometimes it works. But yeah, I understand. And that's what I mentioned to this leader. I said, you know, I'm being treated as guilty until proven innocent. And I told him, I said, Islamically, you know, it's not just American law. Um, and I actually was approaching it even more so with Islam itself. Um, I mean, there's actually a parallel here with American law and with Islam that... You don't treat people with, like, and especially like Islamically, you're not supposed to treat people with suspicion. You're not supposed to spy on people. You're not supposed to back by, you know, gossip or slander. You know, if there's, if there's something, if you have a question mark about somebody, if there's something that concerns you or whatever, you don't assume or accuse. You go to that person directly and, and, and address it with that person directly. And I explained this to him. I said, Islamically, that's what you do. And you don't, and I, you know, and, and it's the same thing with American law, too, is it's innocent until proven guilty. And I, I told him this. I said, you want all these documents. I said, you know, I've already given you my word as a Muslim that I'm a woman. You've, you know, the office has seen two government IDs. Now you need a medical document. You're essentially treating me as guilty until proven innocent, which is not acceptable. I mean, that's not how the American legal system is supposed to work. Um, but, but, you know, with him, I was really focusing more you on... You challenged on the, him with uh, Islamic law. Yeah, I was really addressing... Because, you, know, you know, he's a Muslim leader. And I said, I said, first of all, these rumors that are going around, these people that are... Nobody came to me directly. Instead of them coming to me, they went to you. 
without even coming to me first. I said, and, 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 I, and I said, the burden of proof is on them. If they think that I'm a man, if they think that I'm anybody other than who I purport to be, they need to bring the proof. It's not my job to prove myself. If they're making an accusation, because I told them, I said, essentially I'm being accused of being a man cross-dressing as a woman. You know, I'm essentially being accused of like deceiving people with my gender. They need to bring proof of this. They shouldn't even have come to the office unless they had proof. So I explained this. The, the whole thing about it was un-Islamic. Whoever complained was un-Islamic. The way this leader ha handled it was also un-Islamic. Anyway, that wasn't going to change things. I brought the document, as I mentioned, and I thought the issue was resolved. This was like in the middle, this was like early to mid-July. I think it was like almost early July when, when all this you know, took place. So a good month went by with no issue. I assume the issue was completely resolved. It was August 17th. Their Facebook page, they uploaded their transgender policy to Facebook. And the policy was rather confusing. I mean, it didn't really make a lot of sense. And immediately people were arguing about How so? it. I'd have to look at it, but it was talking about... It was talking about people transitioning from one gender to another, but it was saying, you know... It sounded respectful at first saying that, like, you know, we will help or we will, you know be respectful for people transitioning from one gender to another or something like that. So it sounded kind of respectful at first, but then it started talking about the importance of being in the spaces of those, of, of, of you know, it talked about biological gender. But again, that can be a complex topic. I didn't know what they meant by biology or biological gender. And they were talking about like people that have male biology will not be permitted in female spaces. They were talking about the need to dress according to your biological gender. But what are they talking about here? Chromosomes, anatomy, your legal status on your government documents, what your doctor considers you now. I mean, they weren't clear it was on it. And another, the real issue with the policy, too, that I noticed was part of it was actually illegal because it said, in, and I don't have it in front of me now, but it said that the policy also applies to any venues that host their functions. They actually, you know, the Tempe Mosque works with the Muslim Students Association sometimes and like other groups, like they will actually have lectures and things on the ASU campus. Um, I've been to talks and so forth, and we'll end up having a, you know, we'll, they'll have a lecture or a video and a discussion, and then we'll break and have prayer. Sometimes there's food. So there will be campus events. They have some of the, they have the Eid holiday prayer at the Phoenix Convention Center. Um, they have dinners at the Marriott Hotel. Those institutions have their own policies, and even though a religious institution doesn't have to follow the, the discrimination laws, because religion, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's not a workplace, first, it's religion. First Amendment, yeah. Yeah, it's different. But when you have an event at a hotel or on a school campus or in a government building, like Phoenix Convention, you know, if you're in a government building, you have to follow the federal and state laws. They're not, and I, I'm very upset. Like, you're not going to tell a woman to use a man's bathroom because she can't on, on ASU campus because she can't prove her biology with a medical document. You're not going to do this. You know, it, it, ASU, U of A, none of these institutions are going to allow that. I mean, if, you're, if your documents say that you're female, you're a female. So their policy, that part of their policy, I mean, I'm not an attorney, uh, but I, 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 can, I can tell you it's illegal. It sounds a little fake. Well, the, you can't you can't oh. use your own religious policy to control an institution that you don't own. You can't force your policy onto ASU. It's right. not going to work. Right. In one aspect, the government can't control the religious institution, and in the other aspect, the religious institution can't control the government. Absolutely. So, so the technically, this might kind of be a little. You know. Exactly. And, you know, even though I don't think it's fair for the Tempe Mosque to be doing all of this stuff, questioning my gender and forcing me to provide all of this documentation, 
on their property religiously, you know, they can govern the prayer spaces. They can tell me where to pray. They can tell me where to eat dinner. They, you know, they can do these things on their property. At ASU or at the Phoenix Convention Center or at the Marriott or wherever else, sometimes they even have things at public parks. They can't, they can't override the state and federal law or the policies of those institutions. Like ASU, for instance, and U of A will say, you know, they allow campus groups, they allow religious organizations on campus. But guess what? Those organizations, I know this for a fact, like when I was at the U of A, like you had, if you wanted to, to, to use a building on campus, you had to fill out a form. And one of the things is you have to agree to their non-discrimination policy. So you can't, you know, so this, their policy is really bad. I mean, on legal grounds, it's just bad. Yeah. A few days after the release of their um, transgender policies, what happened? So this was just a few days later. It was like a Monday night that they had posted that policy and they had deleted it Tuesday morning. Of course, people already took screenshots, you know. Because there was already controversy. And then I go to the Friday prayer, you know, again, just a few days later. And I, had, I was in the, I mean, I was in the sisters' prayer hall for, you know, 30 minutes. I prayed with the women, as I always do. And when everything was over with and they were just making announcements, um, you know, this woman comes up to me. And, you know, me and her have always been on very positive terms. I was really shocked for her, of all people, to, to say this. But she's like, oh, you can't you can't be here. And I'm like, what do you mean? She says, with the women. And I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, we had a meeting about this yesterday. And I knew then what the problem was. And I, I kind of lost my temper. And, you know, people in the Muslim community, especially that know me, for me to raise my voice in the mosque, I mean, it's, it's, it's never happened before. And so when that happened, and it wasn't that bad, don't get me wrong, but like people knew there was a problem. And it was very out of character for me. And I'm like, you know what? I kind of raised my voice. I said, I'm tired of these rumors. I said, these rumors need to stop. Well, this other woman approaches um, and says that she needs me to come downstairs to the office. So the two women walked me to the office. There was already a, a leader, a male leader in the community waiting at the bottom of the stairs. I mean, it was very, it was very humiliating. Anyway, to the woman's credit, the one that made those statements, she did call later and apologize. So I'm not, you know, I'm not going to mention her name or anything. You know, she apologized. I accept it. We make mistakes. We move on. Forgiveness. Absolutely. And I forgive her. It actually may have been a good thing that she confronted me like that because by her doing that, it caused me to speak up in the mosque and by doing so it caused all these people to, to hear it and by them hearing it it actually allowed for me to get all this support it helped people to Didn't, know there was so, a problem in the first place so by her confronting you and, and and you raising your voice when it's not typical and then people you know pay attention when they're not used to exactly hearing someone it helped it helped to notify the community that there was a problem and did it also help you be able to talk about it publicly. Yes. Well, here's what happened. You know, when, when, when this incident happened in the mosque, no one really knew what was going on. They just knew that there was an issue and I had raised my voice and I was escorted out. So they didn't know what it was because I didn't, no one, you know. But um, what I found out was there had already been rumors going around. So again, back in that July meeting, I thought everything was kept between me and that chairman of the board. So whoever complained, you know, those rumors I can't control. Anyway, I'm kind of jumping around. So they, they called me into the office. This was on August 21st. And that's when it got, you know, fairly heated. And all these, bo like, all, there were four leaders in there in total, including the imam, the chairman that was from the original meeting, this other male leader that I, that he's not on the board, but he's a leader there. And then there was another board member. So more of the top leaders. Yeah, exactly. It was all top leaders. And... Right away, I found out that confidentiality had been violated, and worse, lies were told. Um, this one board member I didn't know said, well, you can't, you had agreed in the original meeting to stay out of the women's section. I'm like, I never said that. Why would I? And, and, and then I realized, well, see, they were talking after all. 
So that proved that confidentiality was broken. Then, you know, and I showed him my ID. I'm like, you know, I was, I'm like, I'm tired of this. I said, you see, and it shows me actually in my hijab. You know, ID photos show your face, of course, but it does show me in my hijab or my headscarf. And it says female. And he's like, that's not good enough. You have male biology. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, we had a meeting about this. There was a board meeting. And you had told this chairman in the original meeting that I had male biology. I'm like, I never said that. Everybody has male biology. Now, did I... <laughs> well, he knew that I was assigned male at birth, but again, okay. I didn't understand what they were saying. You know, this whole thing about male biology. I think I know what they're getting at. They weren't clear with what they were getting at. But when this accusation that happened in that meeting, that even though my, do even though my ID says female, he, he seemed to think that I still have, quote, male biology. What they're getting at without them saying the words, what they're getting at is, you know, physical anatomy. That's, that's what they're arguing. He didn't say the words. Well, he just... they were concerned about your physical sexual anatomy as far as Even though they don't the... say that. But okay. Exactly. They, they didn't come out and say it. But if, if I was to be straightforward and clear, we're saying we're concerned about your male physical Alleged anatomy. Alleged anatomy. Exactly. And, and, and whether or not you have this anatomy or not will dictate whether you can pray with the women or not. That's where it seemed like they were going with this. Okay, so that was and kind of your perception. That was my perception. Okay. Well, the imam came in. You know, they weren't, not all four of the leaders were in the room at the same time. But, you know, then they started referencing the letter that I had the medical document that had been given to this, this original board member. So I realized they had seen it. One of them is like, well, that, that letter was just saying that you had a mental, you know, that it was just mental, that it was not physical, like, like kind of like a psychiatrist where you just had an evaluation where you kind of just mentally transition. I, I said, that's not what it said. It was a primary care doctor. And I'm like, I can bring back the same document that you were given in the first place. I can show you exactly what it said. And they started saying that the document said I had male, that I had, that I still had male biology, or that it wasn't clear. I don't know every word of what they were saying, but they were making accusations that the document didn't say what it actually said. And again, this proved that, that they you are a certified female, right? And they breached confidentiality on that too. And this, this chairman of the board actually admitted to it that he, that he showed the document to the rest of the board and to the imam. So, I mean, it just, it was absolutely atrocious. And on this board, apparently there's some doctors because they said they had passed it around to some doctors. It's like, what? And the doctors didn't like the way the document was worded. They didn't even like the type of doctor that wrote the document. I don't have a doctor-patient relationship with any of those doctors. They were never given permission to see the document. Now they're going to give medical advice on a document to non-doctors who are then going to come to me and tell me. Do you see how where this is right. going? Right. In, in other words, they didn't say, hey, we have some doctors who want to talk to you or maybe examine you to find out what, what our concerns are about. Yet they just provided the doctors with loose information. Absolutely. They didn't go to the source, and then they made judgments based on that. Worse on, exactly, and, and to drive that point home more, there had been multiple meetings about me without me in the meeting. So that means that I'm not there to actually defend my case. If I had been in the meetings and been able to explain the document, if I had been with the whole board and been able to explain this to the whole board, I think it would have been different. And that woman that I told you about that originally had, had confronted me in the mosque, she had referenced that there had been a meeting the day before. She's not on the board. It, it's very complicated, but I, I figured this all out. Totally un-Islamic. So basically it was a two-way kind of thing. And you, you st it started out where you had regular congregants. How many, I don't know, but you had regular congregants that then went to the leaders to complain about me saying that they had a question about my gender. So it started with people spreading rumors amongst themselves and then going to the board. Then the board sent this one leader to me. 
And that was where everything was supposed to be confidential between just me and him. Didn't happen. He leaked the medical document and the confidential discussion to the rest of the board and the rest of the leaders. But those other leaders then leaked information back out to now the regular congregants who are not in leadership. Because that woman that confronted me said there had been a meeting. She was never on the board, so how'd she even know about the meeting? So, it, it, you and know. The whole time this it's, whole it's, thing's it's going on. Yeah. And no one's talking to you directly. Exactly. They're all talking about you. It would have been so simple if the, whoever had the concern could have just come to me directly and asked me, and I would have put it to rest. If they chose to go to the leaders, the leaders could have talked to me directly, kept it confidential, confidential, and that was it. But it was like two layers of a privacy breach because you had the head leader breach it to the rest of the leaders. And then how many of those other leaders breached it, I don't know, but it did actually, the board actually spread stuff out to the regular community. Anyway, they said, this was on the 21st of August, I had to bring back another medical document that they would accept. And if I did that, they'd continue to allow me to use the women's section as normal. Or I would have to start praying with the men, wearing men's clothes. I mean, you know, I don't even own that men's clothes. Ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous. And I was, I was argue, you know, I, I argued against that. And he's like, well, these are your options, or I'm going to call the police and have a restraining order put on you. So it was very ugly. Uh, call the police to get the... Yeah, because, like, you know, it's somehow? private property. So what he's saying is either I abide by his policy... Or I, you know, I will, you know, if I, if I refuse to abide by their policy, I will be removed from the property by the police, basically. His, wow. Yeah. I mean, his words was that he would call the police and have a restraining order. I mean, legally, they don't do restraining orders. It's, it's trespassing. But that was his words. Well, uh, It's wow. pretty, pretty bad. So normally I would have still tried to keep this private. But by the time I got home, like before I had even talked about it to other people, I found out this had already been spread to dozens of people. I would say by that night, hundreds knew. It had left the Tempe Mosque and the news had already traveled to Chandler. By the next day, it sounded to me like thousands knew, like everybody knew. Now see, I'm a very well-known activist, so the news traveled, but like people in Tucson, I heard knew. I mean, that's how it spread. And it seemed that it even spread to the local news. Well, here's what happened. See, I didn't post anything immediately on Facebook yet. I think I posted that night or something. But I also have media contacts on my page too, because I do a lot of activist stuff. I wouldn't have gone public about this if it weren't for the fact that they already, the, the, the mosque leaders had already violated my privacy. To give you an example, I found out from a woman two or three days later that at that same day, I see, when I got kicked out of there that day, see, they say they didn't really ban me, it's, but it's, they either want me to prove myself or I, or I can't go, essentially. So it is a banning. I had gone, they have two services or two Juma prayers. I had gone to the first one that day. And it was the second, they had called the meeting when I, when the first one was over, you know, and they had called that meeting. Anyway, when I left, they had, then the second one, the, the second Juma prayer had started. Well, I found out two or three days later from a woman that in that second Juma prayer, during that time, somebody else, not a board member, somebody, a regular congregate, actually had a piece of paper with my information on it that they were actually showing. I want to correct that. I don't know if it was a piece of paper. It may have been something on their phone. But they did have a document. With they, my they researched information about you. They found a document that they were sharing. Yeah. Behind your back. To exactly. And exactly. So where did they get this stuff? Again, this leader had violated my privacy to the rest of the leaders, and I found out since then what happened. I, again, a lot of the, I can't prove all this, but I know for, I, I have found out that you know it, it's kind of a, one of those things like the husband is on the board but the wife isn't, 
and what the husband learned in the meeting then outside of the meeting he told his wife then the wife tells all the women total violation of privacy well I, I, I understand exactly what you mean totally uh, an aspect of our humanity that yeah. that's just kind of the way we are the, the, this idea of, of being guilty and or being innocent until proven guilty exactly is a concept that we all have to consciously achieve I mean by human nature you're guilty until proven innocent. and it's sad and it's not supposed to be that way I mean it's not supposed to be that way in the American legal system and I know Islamically it's not supposed to be that way either well that's why we I think that's why we have core values yeah. that we have to remind ourselves to hold ourselves to because the core values of what we want to achieve a lot of times goes against our own human nature yeah so I went public at you know because I didn't really have a choice you know by the end of that day there were so many rumors traveling if I recall I had posted on my Facebook a statement but in the statement I didn't actually talk about how I was born I left it open where I basically was talking about how there's these questions about my gender going on in the community but by the next day, I found out, you know, people that aren't even on the board, like I said, people now had documents with my personal information proving that there had been this change. So at that point, it's like, like, you can't, it was public. Right. So you can't hide from the truth. Exactly. So, you know, a few days later, you know, so I just started posting about it. And then because I'm an activist and I have media contacts, I actually never went to the news meeting. Now people are trying to say that I, I went to the news meeting. I was like, That's actually not true. There's been three articles written about this. All three came to me. I didn't go to them. Now, I chose to talk to them, but I didn't actually go to the media. Sometimes there's a need to change the interpretation on certain things. Islamically, it's kind of the same way on certain issues as well. And a lot of scholars and regular, I mean, a lot of Muslims in general and a lot of scholars generally believe, they generally have an incorrect understanding on transgender issues. And what happens is they, they end up citing a couple of hadith, and hadiths are like sayings and actions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They'll cite a couple of hadiths and say, well, you can't change Allah's creation. You know, like you're not supposed to have cosmetic worked on or even like doing things to your eyebrows and stuff they'll cite like that hadith saying you know you're not supposed to change all his creation or they'll say that you're you know, there's another one that says you're not supposed to imitate the opposite sex so they'll cite these things trying to say that being transgender is haram or that it's prohibited but again, it's you know, it's it's but like. But what's the other perspective? There's that? always another side to this because it's it's like this side trying to say that who I am is not correct. You know that you know that this whole mentality that you know this transphobic kind of mentality that if you're born a man, you're always a man, and that's it. I mean, that's that's where transphobia kind of you know that's the position it takes is that. You know, when you go through a, tr a gender transition, that they try to say that it's not legitimate, that you're, you know, how you were born is, is you can't change that. So Islamically, there are scholars that tr that argue this point, and, and sad to say, I mean, in many ways, I don't want to say that's the mainstream view, but it's a very common understanding that people will say that a gender transition is, is not allowed. Well, and that's usually people who don't have any personal relationship with anybody exactly. like that or his personal knowledge. And it's rare. So how do you see it? So I see it very different. I've done some research. Now again, I'm not a scholar. But they bring these two or three hadith to point to to, to, to make their view on this. You know, they say, well you can't change all his creation. You can't imitate the opposite sex. There's actually hadith that take a different approach. Even though even though Islamically we do say men are men and women are women, in early Islam there are historical examples of people like me. They call them my pronunci my pronunciation may be wrong, but there's an Arabic word called muhanath. And that word actually is described as biological males who are the effeminate ones. 
and they actually were they weren't punished they were not actually punished for imitating the opposite sex as long as they were naturally the way they are meaning they're not deliberately doing it for like entertainment or you know it, perverse reasons yeah if, if they're natural and there's actually early fatwas which are legal rulings I mean 1400 years ago there's actually evidence for this they were not punished under these other hadith that they were trying to use. They actually were allowed into women's spaces, and they were actually... Women didn't even have to cover in front of them as long as they didn't have desires towards women. And so there's actually evidence of this, and I've actually seen research, too, that they actually did do medical procedures. There were surgeries done. Interesting. Now, let's be honest here. I mean, those surgeries were, I mean, very primitive Archaic, compared, to, yeah. compared to today. But, you know, they, the common term that people used back then, you know, the English equivalent would be eunuchs. You know, they would, you know, sur they would surgically make people eunuchs. But it's very much the same. I mean, I don't want to say it's very much the same, but... It, I believe that the research I've done and that, you know, and I'm not an expert. I mean, there's already been scholars who have done this research who know way more than I do. We kind of have a legal conflict within Islam where, you know, they have their view, we have our view. I believe my view is the correct one. I don't believe that I've done anything wrong. I believe that I should be allowed into women's spaces. I believe Islamically I am a woman. Well, you female. believe 100% that you are a woman. Absolutely. In the story. Yeah, I am a woman, you know, medically, legally, mm -hmm. socially, and Islamically. And personally. Personally, I mean, on every level. They're disputing it. Now, in terms of the Tempe Mosque, they actually haven't cited any sources they came up with this transgender policy. They never actually cited the Quran. They never cited the Hadith. They never cited any fatwas. <clears throat> they didn't cite anything. They just come up with this policy. If they hadn't done all this stuff behind my back, we could have had an intellectual discussion. We could have talked about the science of this. We could have talked about Islamic knowledge on the topic. We could have discussed all the, all the evidence. And we could have worked together for a resolution. And I'm, I'm open-minded on this stuff. Look, and, I'll, I, and I definitely, you know, um, I don't want anybody uncomfortable around me. And I don't want to be uncomfortable around others. You know, I don't think I should have to make compromises because, again, I am a woman. But if we had had these discussions openly and honestly with everybody together in the same room, you know, we could honestly find a resolution. You know, if it is true that there's large numbers of women uncomfortable with me, fairly or not, you know, it doesn't mean that that's right that they're uncomfortable with me. You know, it, you know, even though I am a woman, you know, would I be willing to, to, you know, to maybe do some things a little differently just to make people comfortable? Maybe. Better yet, bring those women that are complaining into the same room to the same discussion yeah. so that we can all talk. And guess what? You know, it's okay if not everybody agrees. But if you have, it goes back to like these like these issues with the protests and counter protests. You know, when you can sit down and have an open dialogue and learn from each other, usually you can have some kind of a resolution. Maybe not everybody's 100% happy, but you make it work. And that's what I want. The real responsibility lies with the leaders. I feel the leaders approached me with a position of phobia, with a position of ignorance, really with a position of fear. That, you know, oh my gosh, you know, kind of like how, I hate to say it, it's, it's this whole thing about liability. You know, they're so worried about, you know, every T crossed, every I dotted. Again, I don't want to make assumptions about how, you know why they did the things it, they did. It just appears this way. It appears this way. Okay. And you know, up when you're talking about how you know not being upfront and honest, when you have me, it's basically. I mean, we have three main things that happened here. Number one, four things that I can think of. Number one, multiple meetings about me behind my back without me present before talking to me. So actually, you know, already having meeting after meeting after meeting about me before even coming to me first. Very, I mean, it's un-Islamic, it's unprofessional, it's just not how you do things. That's one thing. Second, you know, 
talking to detectives, uh, you know, and they admitted to this, you know, talking to detectives about me, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing anything illegal. You know, I, I don't know what it was about, but... They were going to the authorities about you. It's possible the authorities came to them because of my activism and protest. I don't know. You don't know who came to who, but it, th these things happened. But imagine, when you find out that your leaders have talked to police detectives about you, imagine how much, what does that do to your trust? It's gone. Why wasn't I at the meeting? You know, if my name was going to come up in that meeting, why didn't they have the detectives in the meeting, the leaders in the meeting, and me in the meeting? After having that meeting, then people can break off and have their discussions. But again, having this done first. And then the third thing is doing this private background investigation on me without having talked to me first. And then the fourth thing um, was not accepting official documentation. Number one, my word as a Muslim actually Islamically should be good enough. Two, they've been given two government documents, I mean, two government IDs, a state and a federal. And three, I mean, and then a medical document. And, and all of that's still not going to, the credibility is gone. There's none. And I just want to make it clear, you know, it's not a problem with Islam itself. And this is what I, I made a video myself where I, I said this, and it's like, you know, you can't judge, people shouldn't judge Islam off of the basis of Muslims. And that goes with anything else that, you know, you can have, people are people. And I don't want people to think that it's, a, I don't want people to think that what they did to me means that it was, you know, that, it, that it's a bad religion or that it's the religion's fault. It's not the fault of the religion. It's, so to, it's the fault of people so, making bad decisions. So to summarize, summarize what, I, what, I, what I believe you're trying to say is that... Um, the way people act sometimes contradicts the core values of the religion. Absolutely. Well, that, that, <laughs> that's true within, I, I think, a lot of religions. I think we've touched on that a few times. You know, it's, it's just one of those things. It's like it, easy to say something, harder to do it. You know, the religion, you know, and this is every religion, Just I'm sure, just about, you know, you're supposed to treat your neighbor well. That's well a, but, is that a... Is that a something that's preached in Islam? Absolutely. But guess what? Because people are people, it's easy. I can get up on a microphone and say, Islam says, treat your neighbor with kindness. But I'm going to be tested on that, just like anybody else. And if I see a neighbor, you know, drop the groceries, or, or, or maybe the neighbor's annoying me somehow and has the music too loud. Now I'm being tested. Am I actually going to follow through with what I preached? Right. Some people do and some people don't. You know, there may be people that don't help their neighbor pick up the groceries. There may be a person that, that yells at their neighbor. So again, it's like it's easy to say something, harder to do it. Well, same thing in Christianity. Yep. It's love thy neighbor. That exactly. isn't your immediate neighbor. That's everybody. It, it's so. And the thing is, and I'll just say this too. Um, you know, I, I do hope resolution is sought. And even though there's a conflict that I have with the leaders of the community there, you know, if we're all able to resolve it and so forth, you know, I'm willing to, you know, I'm willing to forgive them. If they feel that I've made mistakes, I'm willing to, you know, seek their forgiveness. You know, I'm willing, I'm willing to, you know, do the, you know, I'm, I don't think I've done anything wrong. They probably don't think they did anything wrong. But I think, you know, in my mind, you know, I'm willing to, I want to make things, I want to... There's work. still a conflict right now. There is now. still a conflict okay. right now, but if we do make it, if, if we are able to work it all out, even though it's all been publicized now, if we are able to work it all out and the issue is, is resolved, I'm not going to hold grudges. I'm not going to, you know, say a year from now that, oh, you know, these people and this... No, you know what? They made a mistake. They fixed it. We move on. Best case scenario is, you know, sit down, have a reasonable discussion, educate them on the issue, and, and then, you know, and allow me to just continue remaining in the community as I was before, accepted as the woman that I am as before, and go for there. Only as a secondary, not as best of an option, would still be sitting down, having a discussion, and so forth. But if, if the conflict is still there, if they're at least allow, if they're at least willing to kind of 
I, I don't think I should be treated as a third gender, but if it has to go that direction for the sake of allowing me back in the community, only in that case will I go that route. Okay. But if we can resolve it, then yeah, you know, I'm not going to hold grudges, we'll move on. If there continues to be a conflict, like if it's if they're just very belligerent, very stubborn, and just won't deal, if that if it does go that route where they won't even compromise, they won't even do anything, you know, then at that point my job is going to still be, you know, that's that's where the activist in me comes out. I'm going to speak out. You You're know, going to question authority. Yeah, I'm going to bring light to the issue. And there's been three news articles out. So if if they aren't going to compromise, if they aren't going to fix it, then I will have to continue doing my activism on this and 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 say, you know, this isn't right.